continuing in the book of Genesis. We are entering into my favorite part of Genesis when we pick up with the story of Joseph. You guys heard about him in Sunday school, right? Those who grew up in church. And so our scripture reader this morning is Jose Martinez. How are you doing this morning, Jose? Doing great. Great, great. And his mom back here is Patty. And little sister Maria went back there with the King's the Children's Church. And if kids want to go to the children's service, they can, or they're welcome to stay in here. And of course, Natalie is his sister, younger sister. Taller sister, though. Isn't she taller than you? She's as tall as me. Yeah. She's she's as, taller, yeah. I think she's taller. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So follow along as Jose reads for us this, God's word this morning. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites, Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibian, Zibin, the Hevite, and Bashmet, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nabiah. And Ada bore to Esau Eliphaz, Bashmet bore Ru, and Olibama bore Jush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, all his beasts, and all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan. He went to a land away from his brother Jacob. For the possessions were too great for them to dwell together. The land of their sojournings could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau settled in the hill country of Seir, Esau is at home. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilphah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we are binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered together it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, They have gone away. For I heard them say, let us go into Dotham. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dotham. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Thank you, Jose. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we love your word. I'm thankful for a church that loves your word, that we want to study it. We want to not just become full of knowledge. We want to know the God of the word better. So Lord, we cannot, do not want to do this without the help of the Holy Spirit. 
We pray that the Holy Spirit would enter into us and and just fill our hearts and minds and help us to understand the Word of God because He is the teacher as you have promised. And so we thank you for your Word. May we be more like Christ of the Word because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Some people have the misconception that the Bible is a bunch of like stories and all those stories have like a moral, kind of like Aesop's fables, you know, and that you're supposed to learn something from every story. doesn't mean there's not. But that's not, the Bible's not just a collection of cute little stories that make you a little better little person. The Bible is full of history that points to one person, Jesus Christ. And so as we read this story here, if you don't see Jesus in the story, you've missed the whole point. Jesus is the very center of it. Now, we kind of glossed over chapter 36, because basically what chapter 36 is, Esau's genealogical uh, record. Remember, Jacob and Esau were twins. Esau was born first, but Jacob was the one chosen by God because God didn't fall into their social construct of firstborn always runs everything. God's like, no, I'll choose who I want to choose. And he chose Jacob. Esau resented that. And even his father, Isaac, fought it. And he wanted to give the birthright to Esau. But Jacob tricked him out of it, and and all kinds of things happened. Jacob tried to fight for what was already his. We do that a lot as believers. You can see when Esau was born. And really, there's no details in this genealogy. Nothing about, and -and so-and-so lived for this long. It's like a run-through of history, and it's documented so that people who were living at the time that Moses wrote it would understand the history, and would also confirm the validity of Scripture, because it proves that these records were kept and this was part of the historical record. But there's no real details because Esau line doesn't matter as much as Jacob's line matters because the Messiah will come through Jacob, not through Esau. It talks about Esau's three wives, his five sons, and it mentions some of his grandchildren, not all of them, but it lists the kings of Seir and their descendants. Again, it's just recording good history. It's meant to be in the word of God for this reason. But what's interesting is in Ezekiel chapter 35, and there's a prophecy about this vast number of people, the Edomites, that they would disappear, virtually be desolate is the word, means almost gone, and archaeological evidence backs that up. You can't find much about the Edomites throughout history. They were wiped out as a people, just like God prophesied would happen. Herod was one of the few descendants. He was an Edomian, which is an, a, a Greek way of saying an Edomite. He was one of the very few descendants of Esau or Edom. Obadiah is one long prophecy against that nation and again how they would be wiped out. And of course God's word always comes true and it it did. But the Edomites are mentioned as as an example of what not to be. Over a hundred times in the Bible they are mentioned as in don't act like Esau, don't act like his descendants, the Edomites. And I a few weeks, about a month ago, I misspoke and said that they they were, Arabs were descendants of the Edomites. Uh, It's it's um, Isaac's brother that Ishmael, where the Arabs came from. So for, I wanted to correct that there. Um, but the point of this thing is don't be like Esau. Esau lo- lived for the moment. He was hungry. He wanted the pot of that red stew. He's like, yeah, all right, I'll trade you my birthright, my entire inheritance for what will make me feel good in the moment. That really is the story of the Christian life. It is resisting the now and living for the eternal. The world will tempt you, hey, just do this, try this, whatever, and they want you to live for when? Right then. Forget about the consequences in the morning. Forget about the hangover. Forget about the ticket the ticket the cop might write you. Forget about what your employer might think or what your wife might think. Just feel good right now. Instant gratification is what Esau was all about. And the point of scripture is don't, don't be like him. Hebrews 12, 15 summarizes it this way. It says, see to it that no one, and it's talking to believers, that no believer fails to obtain the grace of God. That is that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau. He was unholy because he didn't separate himself from the world. He was right in the thick of it. He lived for the moment and he sold his birthright for one single meal. So now we move into the main passage, Genesis chapter 37, and I'm going to divide it up into five ways. First of all, there's the fatally flawed family, which you will see how dysfunctional this family really is. There's the duo of divisive dreams. You like the alliteration so far? 
There is the special son that's sent, and then there's the son that's sold to slavery, and then there's the deceived dad is the deceived dad is devastated. Okay? So hopefully I'll help you remember all these. So first of all, let's talk about how fatally flawed this family is. Jacob lived now, he's no longer sojourning. Remember a couple chapters ago it says he built a house. So he's no longer a a, um, a traveling shepherd. He's settling down and he's living in the land that God had promised to Abraham and Isaac, his fathers, in the land of Canaan, which will be the future of the promised land. And it says, basically, this is the generation, this is the genesis of Jacob. This is his story. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pastoring, pastoring the flock of his brothers. Now, I want you to think about, for many of you, do you remember what it was like when you were 17? <laughs> Some good memories, some that you'd rather forget. <laughs> Some really stupid, foolish decisions. The list goes on. Some of you aren't there yet. Some of you, are, anybody in here 17 at the moment? Okay, getting close. All right, so I want you to keep that in the back of your head for the next several weeks. Because the Bible talks about Joseph more than Abraham, more than Isaac, for sure, and definitely and more than Jacob. It talks about this fourth patriarch more than all those others. And I want you to keep in mind that all these stories started when he was 17. Okay, so that will make you want to cut him some slack. But it also might impress you that, wow, he did that. And again, of course, years will be added, but still, some of this will happen in his early 20s, and it's quite impressive. So think about all that he's about to go through, the temptation with uh, Potiphar's wife, interpreting dreams, and so forth, and just keep the 17 in the back of your head. Um, and then all this is complicated by not only is he young and foolish at 17, he's got a fatally flawed family. He's got a dad who plays favorites. He's got brothers who hate him. His mom has passed away. I mean, any one of those factors, what if, what if you were 17 and your mom was gone? Life would be hard. What if you were 17 and all of your older brothers hate you? Life would be hard. What if you were 17 and your dad was a jerk? Okay, take any one of those, but put all three together and you see what a challenging situation he is in. But you know what? He doesn't make excuses. He is one of the most impressive Old Testament characters that you will ever read about. It says he was a boy. In other words, he grew up as a young boy with two of his half-brothers from the, the, wife, the wife's handmaids. Okay, And one day he brought a bad report to, about his brothers to their father. Now, what's interesting about this is, is that the word bad report, sometimes it's translated evil report, sometimes it's translated wicked report. And so some people wonder, okay, does this mean it wasn't true? Sometimes that was the case. I don't know if it's the case here or not. It could be a bad report because they did bad and he's reporting about it. It could be a bad report because it's not all true or it's exaggerated. We don't really know. Okay, what we do know, if you kind of step back, is the Bible doesn't give you any specific sin that Joseph ever committed. It kind of hints to it. This might be a hint that maybe he was exaggerating or maybe he fabricated what his brothers did and that's why they hate him. We don't know. But we do know that his brothers were bad dudes. So a bad report about their bad behavior probably is not too far-fetched. Another area we see that Joseph showed something close to a sin is the way that he shares his dreams. You could accuse him of being arrogant or cocky or proud, but you could also say, hey, but he's 17. Who, which one of the 17-year-old boy isn't a little bit of that? So again, the Bible doesn't portray him as perfect, but the, the reason it shows very little of his sin is because he's a picture of Jesus Christ. And so keep that in mind. So we're not trying to cut him slack where he doesn't deserve it. But he does tell on his brothers. Now, Many of you grew up with this phrase here, that snitches get stitches, okay? What's funny is the people who say that are the people who are doing wrong, <laughs> you know? Now, there, I always wonder, where's the balance between you need to report this because it's a problem and you don't want to be a tattletale? And I really don't know where to strike that balance. I do know that if, well, let's go to the extreme. If someone's life is in danger or someone is in, in, in physical harm, you need to say something, and I do know that the people who say this phrase or don't like tattletales are the people who are doing wrong and want to get away with it, okay? 
I think the balance might be in many times, instead of you going and telling someone, you need to say, hey, you need, guys need to stop that. And you take it in your own hands and try to avoid being the tattletale. But evidently, maybe archaeologists think that this phrase began with Joseph's brother. We don't know. But maybe there's a stone somewhere that says snitches get stitches in Hebrew. I don't know. So now Israel, remember God changed his name a few chapters ago? He's, it's Jacob. Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons. He has 13, and he loves one of them is, is his favorite. And here's the reason. Because he was the son of his old age. He's 91 years old when, when he gave birth to Joseph. And so he's his favorite. Maybe it's because he's proud. Look, he, I can still have kids. I'm 91 years old. I don't know. Maybe it's because he had waited this long to have children with Rachel. There's a lot of factors going on, but he made them a favorite. But he really put the icing on the cake or the last straw on the camel's back, if you will, when he gave him this coat of many colors. This is not just, hey, you get the best jacket of all the kids. Many people, many biblical scholars think this is the way of putting the robe on him saying, you know what? Forget Reuben. This is the heir of all things. I'm skipping the firstborn. I'm skipping the second, third, fourth, fifth, all the way down. I'm going all the way down to my favorite and I'm saying he is in charge of all y'all. And when I pass away, he's taken over. Now that kind of makes us think, oh, now we see why they really hate him. Was just because, well, dad, look at my jacket. It's just brown. Why well, can't I have a multicolored coat like him? That, no, there's a whole lot more involved in the family dynamics of this. There's also something interesting. In the Hebrew, we really don't know what this word about the multi, many colored means. We know there was, it, basically the root word means rich or richly fabricated, richly fabricated. little interesting trivia here. Some people, some uh, rabbis think that it means seamless. Does that sound familiar? Who else had a seamless robe? Jesus did. Yeah, that's one of many pictures of Jesus as we'll see here as we move forward. So when his brothers saw, okay, they saw this coat, they could tell it was different. And, and their reaction to this, that their father loved him, more than all their brothers. They, they kind of had a hunch he knew it, but now there was a physical demonstration. Wow, look, dad just rubbing in our face. We, we can really see that what we suspected all along is really true. They hated him and they could not speak peacefully to him. He could walk up and say, hey guys, how's it going? And they're like, get out of my face. And they had nothing nice to say to him whatsoever. Their hatred was not concealed. They, they, didn't, they couldn't even pull off the nasty nice. They couldn't, they couldn't even fake it. They were just totally bluntly evil to him and showed their hatred. This right here is the family that God chooses to become a great nation and a blessing to all the nations of the earth. What can God do with your family? And if he can work with this family, what can he do with yours? Okay, We think, oh, my family is so dysfunctional. My family is so far gone. Are they like this? <laughs> These guys are really messed up. And this is who God chose. You may be here this morning and you've got a history that if we were to have you get up and share, it would be very embarrassing to you. Maybe you've done things in your past you're very ashamed of. And maybe you think, there's no way God could use me. Look at these clowns. God used them. Now, that's not an endorsement to be a clown. <laughs> that is not an, a, a, condoning bad behavior. What I am promoting to you this morning is the grace of God. That God shows his favor to people who do not deserve it. If you're trying to earn the love of God, if you're trying to earn your way to heaven, it's not going to happen. The only way you can make it to heaven is through the grace of God because there's none righteous, no, not one. There's not one person that deserves God's love, that deserves heaven, that it deserves eternal life. It is the gift of God, and he gives it to even the worst of us, like this family proves full well. The second point, we see a duo. There's two divisive dreams. Now, Joseph, he had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, notice it's to the brothers first, they hated him even more. They're like, man, we thought we hated this guy. Now we hate this guy on steroids. I mean, I just cannot stand this guy. And you will see that this boils up to they do, they do want to and will try to murder him. He, that's, that's some serious hatred there. And he said to him, hey, hear this dream that I have dreamed. And again, I'm not sure why he's doing this. But let's just stop for a second and say, what if the brothers had thought about, wait a minute, 
we don't like you, Joseph. We don't really care for your dream. But who gives dreams? And who gives dreams of this caliber? God does. So maybe I shouldn't hate the messenger. I should listen to the message. Maybe I should think, okay, maybe this, if this dream is from God, forget how it affects me and forget, forget how it affects Joseph. If I believe in God, if I trust that God's heart is good, then I need to accept this dream that maybe I do need to let this young punk brother rule over me. And so if they had just thought about that for a second, who was in charge? And really, if we truly believe in the sovereignty of God and say amen if you do, we believe that God's in control of everything. When bad things happen, we have to accept it. Something bad happened to me this morning, small scale, okay? And I'm, I was kind of prepared for it. So how many of you do version? Okay, so in version, when you open up to the homepage, one of the first things that shows you is your streak, right? How many days in a row where you have not missed reading the Bible? I don't know what the days was, but my streak was five and a half years. I have not missed reading from my Bible for five and a half years. This morning I woke up and it said streak, one. I'm like, what? What happened? I read yesterday. And I said to Tammy, I said, didn't I read yesterday? She said, yeah, I heard you reading it. But it decided that you version said, nope, you're starting over. You missed yesterday. So, but I, I thought, okay, I'm not going to let that bother me. I'm not going to let that frustrate me. Okay, it's under the sovereignty of God. There must be a reason. Maybe I was getting proud of my streak. Who knows? But whatever. We have to trust in the sovereignty of God that when things happen that we don't like, we go with it. We roll with it. And on the other hand, did God tell Joseph, hey, go tell your brothers a dream? No. If you had that dream, what's the need to share? Bragging? <laughs> Have you noticed in Texas we've, we've perfected the humble brag? We can say things and we kind of slip it in, especially on Facebook. Oh, I was so honored to, blah, 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 blah. And we just pictures of us getting an award or whatever. And, and it's like, doesn't Proverbs say, don't praise yourself, but let another man's lips praise you? And yet we kind of have ways of slipping it in. And, this, and Joseph's like just bubbling over, excited with this dream. And he has to go and brag to his brothers about it. So again, the Bible doesn't blatantly call it a sin, but we could probably just go ahead and put it under that category. He said, behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. Now binding means we're doing this work. I'm working. You're working. Now, when we meet someone, we say, what's your name? What's almost always the next question? What do you do for a living? We're very work-oriented. We're very proud of our work, okay? So keep in mind that we're working here. There's not just sheaves in the field, but we're binding them, okay? We're doing the harvest. We're wrapping up the wheat, you know, the hay bales, um, the shockers, as I would call them up the north. Um, binding the sheaves in the field. Now, sheaves of what? Wheat, okay? That's important detail because later, what will his brothers go down to Egypt and ask for? Wheat, okay, that's an important connection there. And he says, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves, all your work gathered around, and this word gathered around, in, in Revelation, where will we gather around? The throne. When you gather in a round, that's around a throne. You don't stand in line for something, you're gathering around. That means you're all gathering around to bow down equally to the throne. He says, so basically, I'm exalted above you, and you guys will purposely, willfully gather around me, and you will bow down to my sheaf, my work. Okay? My work is better than your work. Do you see why that made them so mad? Because, <laughs> I mean, that's an insult to them. They, they, it's not just this dream about these plants. This is, this is something that's insulting them personally. His brother said to him, are you indeed going to reign? Now notice reign and rule, it's not being redundant here. Will you reign? In other words, you're going to be in a position over us, and you're actually going to dominate us with your power over us? You're going to rule over us? So now they hate them even more. You thought at first they hate them, they hate them more. Now they hate them even more, 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 okay, for his dreams and his words. His dreams ticked him off at first, but now the way he's talking about his dreams, it's really ticking him off in the biggest way. So then he dreamed another dream. You think that maybe after the reaction of the first dream, he'd learn to zip it, but he doesn't. <laughs> Behold, I've dreamed another dream, guys. You want to hear about it? No. <laughs> well, please, let me tell you about it. And he's just following them. You can see them walking away. Don't want to hear, Joseph. Don't want to hear. But then this happened. This happened. Joseph, don't want to hear it. Behold, look at this. The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. 
Now, you know what this represents. And now, let me go back here. The sun represents who? The dad. The moon represents the mother. And the 11 stars, obviously the brothers. Now, here's what's interesting about this. Before, well, I won't we'll skip ahead, but there's also some symbolism. This will be repeated again. It's here in the first book of the Bible, but it's also in the last book of the Bible. And a great sign appeared in heaven. This is during the tribulation when God's wrath is being poured out on planet Earth. And it says, a great sign appeared in the heaven and in the skies. A woman clothed with the, the sun, with the moon under her, and, and her head around the crown of 12 stars, because now Joseph is in the mix, because he's also bowing down. Okay, so it's interesting that you see this chiastic structure in the macro, the, the sun, moon, and stars, sun, moon, and stars, the beginning and the end. Notice that the family needed no interpretation of the dreams. He didn't have to say, okay, now here's what this means. They all automatically knew it. It's really interesting that throughout the Bible, Jews don't need an interpretation of dreams. There's a lot of symbols being used. There's stars, there's moon, there's stalks of wheat. There's all these symbols and the Jews know what all the symbols mean because they speak a symbolic language. But you see over and over again in the Bible where a Gentile gets a dream, and what does he or she need to do to understand it? Ask a Jew. Can you think of some examples? Somebody tell me an example. Pharaoh, right? Who else? In the book of Daniel, there's two kings, Belteshazzar and who's the other? Another great name that you want to name your son. Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so in fact, I got a list here. There's also the baker and the butler. They have these dreams. They have no idea what they mean. Gentiles don't know because they don't speak the symbolic language and they're not God's people. So they always go to Jews to understand this. And it's really interesting. Here are the brothers and mom and dad don't need any explanation because they fully understand that God's speaking their language here. So, but when he told it to his father, this time he tells it to his father, and his, and his brothers this time, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother? Now, what's interesting is this is a, either a flashback or the foretelling, Rachel either still alive or he's speaking to her as if she's dead. I believe she's still alive. I think it, when it was telling the, the history, it said that she died at this age, but then it's like they're telling the story later as a flashback to it. So, um, so I, I understand you think your brothers are going to bow down, but I and your brothers are going to bow down and to you, um, bow down on the ground. And his brothers were jealous of him. That could be better translated envious of him. Because, again, jealousy is when you want what's yours. Envy is when you are bothered by what someone else has. But his father kept this saying in mind. So the brothers, their rage is going and going and going and growing. And they're becoming more and more vocal about it. But Jacob, he's too passive. Dinah gets raped. What does he do? Nothing. And his brothers are outraged. And you just see Jacob over and over again not doing anything. And here, I don't know if I want to give him credit because of his history. It's just, oh, he was really wise and meditating over this. I think he's just doing what he does. He's just withdrawing from the situation. So then we see that this special son is sent. And I want you to follow along and see how many times you see Jesus in this. You, in fact, someone once wrote that there are 150 parallels between Joseph and Jesus. I, I haven't studied all of them. I don't know if they're all valid, but there are definitely a lot. And I'm not even going to cover all of them. You may see one this morning that I don't even point out. So watch carefully. So now his brother, brothers went to pasture and, they, and uh, their father's flock near Shechem. That's where they were supposed to be. What just happened last week at Shechem? All the men died. Okay, remember, they, they raped Dinah, their sister, and then the, the prince of Shechem, whose name is Shechem, the town's named after him, wants to marry Dinah, and they start negotiating how they can buy her, and the family, the Jews, are totally insulted by this, but they play along and say, okay, well, if you want to do this and have your daughters marry our daughters and vice versa, then all y'all need to be circumcised because, and they start playing the religion card, okay, which is really bad because the circumcision was a covenant of God being close to his people. And they were using that beautiful picture of, we're going to use this to murder people. And so they had all the men circumcised. And then while they were recovering and not able to fight, they went and killed them all. That's what happened at Shechem. And so now Shechem is just like desolate because they took all their wives and children. Totally wrong situation. God doesn't endorse it at all. And this is where they're going. 
it's not a great place. Even though everybody's dead there, it's still a place of you're walking away from God is the symbolism here. And Israel said to Joseph, aren't your brothers pastoring? at?" But that's what I told him basically because Joseph, Jacob's in charge, Israel's in charge, okay? And he says, come, I will send you to them. Again, he's going to go oversee and get, file a report about them. He's, he's taking the coat even farther, saying, I want you to go supervise your brothers. It's not just, hey, go say hi to them and see how they're doing. I want some oversight here. It's interesting, he sent him. 1 John 4, 14 says, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior to the world. It's another picture of Jesus in, in this story that the Father is sending Joseph out into the world, out into an evil place for his brothers. So he said to him, go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. You got the middle management here. So he sent him from the Valley of Hebron, which was a good place. And he came to Shechem, which is a bad place. And a man was found, wander, found him wandering. Joseph's like, where are they? I don't see them. I'm looking all over here at Shechem, and I don't see the guys. They're not where they're supposed to be. And so this man sees him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, what are you seeking? Now, what if Joseph never encountered this one guy walking through the wilderness there? He just happened to walk by, when you're like, whatever, and this guy just happened to overhear the conversation. You can see God's sovereignty in this whole situation here. And so... Um, I'm always impressed with that. I remember when Isaiah and Caitlin were very young. I mean, Isaiah was about two. Caitlin's a few months old. And we were trying to get custody of them because their parents were really misbehaving and doing wrong. And uh, so we, we had had temporary custody of them. And we wanted to make it permanent. So I went down to Angleton to the courthouse. And I said, hey, what do I need to do to file papers pro se to get this done? And they said, well, the probably that we're not lawyers. We can't give legal advice. We're just clerical staff here at the courthouse. The best person would be to talk to judge so-and-so. But she's not here on Tuesdays, et cetera, et cetera. And who walks in the door? The judge. And she's never there on Tuesdays, but she just happened to walk in at the same time. And if I had been five minutes earlier, I would have missed her. If I had been 10 minutes later, I would have missed her. But who was in charge of the whole situation? God was. And they said, Your Honor, this is Mr. Milborn. He's wanting to do this. She said, come on in my office. She shows me everything to do to get custody of Isaiah and Caitlin. And it worked out beautifully. Right down there. Who orchestrated that? God did. We have, we have to be alert to the sovereignty of God because it makes us realize how rich and powerful he is in the good things and the bad. You have a heart attack. You've got to accept the sovereignty of God. Now, I'm not saying we should avoid mistakes or we shouldn't eat better, okay? But God uses our failures and our successes. God works all things together for our good and for his glory. So uh, you can see that, that this guy hadn't just wandered right through there and seen him wandering and just happened to overhear the conversation, as we'll see. He says, I am seeking my brothers. He said, tell me, please, where they are pastoring the flock. They were supposed to be in Shechem. They're not where they belong. And the man said, they have gone away. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan, not Shechem, where they belong. So Joseph, so they went from a bad place to a worse place. They're not obeying their father. They're estranged from him. They're disobeying. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan, just like the guy said. By the way, some rabbis think that this man who encountered him was Gabriel. There's nothing in the Bible that says that. And there's like a new trend in Christianity that is like trying to make it more Jewish, which I'm all for getting back to our Jewish roots and all that stuff. But you have Christians who are now wearing tassels and wearing yarmulkes and do all kinds of things to become very Jewish. And they're saying, but rabbis say this, rabbis say that. Do you realize that the Pharisees were rabbis? <laughs> okay. The Sadducees were rabbis. Jesus' biggest enemies were rabbis. He was the, one of the very few good ones. Okay. So just because a rabbi says something doesn't mean it's true. In fact, I see a lot of really weird superstitious stuff that rabbis have said over the years about the Old Testament. There's nothing in the Bible that tells you this is Gabriel. You know, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but they can't just say emphatically that it was. They saw him from afar before he came near to them and they conspired against him to kill him. They see just the, just the silhouette of Joseph walking over the hill is like, oh man, I hate that kid. 
I just want to string that kid up and hang him up by his toes. And I want to slit his throat. I want to skin him like a squirrel. I want to do all this kind of talk here. And they, they hate him. And yet this is another picture of Jesus. Look at the language there. They conspired against him to kill him. And in Matthew 12, 14, but the Pharisees, rabbis, went out and conspired against him how to destroy or kill Jesus. They said here to one another, here comes this dreamer. You know, that's the nickname now. That, that, that's a derogatory term. Oh, this dreamer. And then come now, let us kill him. Let us throw him. The Hebrew word here, throw him, means like if you were to say, if you wanted to dump somebody, like a dead body. Let's throw him like a dead body into one of the pits. And then we, we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him. We'll say it to dad. And we'll see what will become of his dreams. Yeah. See what they're doing there? They're fighting against God. They think Joseph's the problem. But who gave Joseph the dreams? God did. Kind of reminds me in the book of Acts, when the Pharisees were all up in arms about Peter and Paul and Silas preaching the gospel. And Gamaliel steps up and says, you know what? If this is not of God, it'll fizzle and die like every other uprising. But if this is of God, then you guys are fighting against God. Good advice here. But these brothers don't see that they're looking in the short term here. But when Reuben heard it, again, what did Reuben just do last week? He slept with one of his father's concubines. He's establishing himself as the alpha male. He's trying to overcome God's plan of who's going to be in charge. And then so I'm sorry, I didn't read what he said. He said he heard he rescued him out of their hands saying, Let, let's not take his life. So he's, he's trying to be the diplomat in this situation here. And Reuben said, shed no blood. Let's throw him in this pit here in the wilderness and do not lay a hand on him. So he's trying to spare his life. And he even explained, he said they may rescue him out of their hand to restore him. What's interesting is he's trying to rescue Joseph. But a few years later, Joseph's going to rescue him. And the roles will be reversed. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him. And the Hebrew word literally means like skinned him like an animal. They ripped the clothes off. They didn't say, hey, would you take your jacket off? They're like beating him up and they're ripping it off of him. They probably ripped the jacket in the process, of the, the robe, and the robe of many colors that he wore. It's reminding you about the colors, about the prominence, what this means. They try to strip him of him being the one in charge of the family. They're not just taking clothes off him. They're trying to take authority away from him. This reminds us of Matthew 27. And when they mocked Jesus, they stripped him of the robe. Same picture, Joseph, Jesus. And they put his own clothes on him and they led him away to crucify him. And as you can guess, there is a chiastic structure in this passage that tells us what's the clue that we should be looking for. It starts with the robe of many colors. It ends with the robe of many colors. And then it moves on to talk about their father and the father and what a role he plays and then it talks about the dreams, and then towards the end, it reinforces the dreams. And then it talks about the brothers were jealous against him, so the brothers conspired against him. And then you see that um, they, went, they were supposed to be watching over the father's flock. That's repeated. The flock represents the potential church, and they're not overseeing it well. And then they, he says, I will send you to them, and he sent them. And what did he send them to do? What's the most important part of this passage? So he said to him, go to see if it is well with your brothers, with the flock, and bring me word. You see how Jesus and the Father pictured this? Jo Jacob sends Joseph and says, I'm sending you to see how things are going with your brother, to make sure things are well with them, and then you come back to me and tell me how it went. Jesus sent God sent the Father, sent Jesus into the world to make things well with us here on earth and then go back to the Father to present us as the church. And so the picture of Jesus is, is all over this. Again, John 4, 14. In fact, this time I'm going to ask you to read it with me. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Is he your Savior? You see, they sent, he sent Joseph. What did they do to him? They rejected him. The Father sent Jesus. What did most of the world do? They rejected him. Have you rejected him or have you accepted him? There's no middle ground. By not accepting him, you are rejecting him. Do you know Christ is your Savior? Maybe today you can make that decision. So not only do you see the special son was sent, but now we see this special son is sold to slavery. And they took him and they threw him into a pit. 
and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. Now think about that. That's devastating for two reasons. If you're going to get thrown in a pit, would you like to have some water in there? <laughs> I would rather splash than hit the rock bottom hard. He, who knows what broke on this? He broke ribs, separated his shoulder. We have no idea. But also, if you're in a desert climate, now you're dehydrating. You've had a long walk. Your brothers weren't where they were supposed to be after you've walked a few days. Now you walk another day's journey farther. Maybe you ran out of water because you only brought enough water for this long of a journey. You're dehydrated. Maybe you're hoping that when you reached your brothers, they'd give you some water. No, they just give you the, the pit. And you hit rock bottom and you have nothing to drink while you're down there. They really did hate him, didn't they? And so then they sat down to eat. No big deal. They don't even know if their brother's dead in the bottom of the pit they just threw him. Okay? And they're like, no big deal. We can eat. Pass me the potatoes, you know? And then looking up, they saw a caravan. Now watch the names here. This is really interesting. Let me ask you a question. I'll just go ahead and tell you. It's a trick question. Who sold Joseph into slavery? The answer is his brothers. No, they did not. <laughs> and people read this story all the time. But what? They wanted to sell him into slavery, but they didn't succeed. Watch the names carefully. In fact, I'll explain as I go. So who's, who do they look up in, in the distance? They see a caravan coming. We don't know how far away, 500 yards. We don't know. You recognize camels, a bunch of camels in line. So it's a caravan. And so they see them coming and they have this idea. You know, the Ishmaelites are coming. Now notice Ishmaelites and with their camels and they're bearing gum, balm, and myrrh. How many gifts? Three. What's that sound like? The wise men, maybe. I don't know if that's a stretch or not. I know one of them is in common, myrrh, because it was, what did the wise men bring? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Again, maybe there's something in common there. Maybe I'm just reaching. I don't know. Then Judah, the second oldest, said to his brothers, what profit is if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Blood representing his death. We hide his death. We cover up the murder. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, right? Remember that name. And let our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. So they're like, well, let's be merciful. I mean, he actually is our own brother. He's related to us. We, don't, we could actually make some money off him instead of killing him. And it'll be a win-win situation. So the other 11 uh, listen to him. This is just another picture of Jesus. In Gospel of John chapter 1, Jesus came to his own people and they did not receive him. His own flesh and blood, Jesus was born a Jew, the Jews rejected him, just like Joseph was rejected by his brothers. Then watch this, Midianite, not Ishmaelite, traders pass by while they're eating, okay? And they, in some translations, put in italics, and the brothers drew Joseph out. And that's where people get the idea the brothers did this. But the brothers is not in Hebrew. If you have in certain translations, you see the brothers, it's in italics, because the translators are trying to help you figure out who the they are. They should have left it alone. The they is antecedent to the Midianites. The, the, the Midianites are the ones who drew them out. So watch this. The brothers throw Joseph in a pit. They go off a little ways and they have a meal. They see Ishmaelite traders coming. But over this direction, here comes some Midianites. And they hear this, hey, help, help. And they're like, man, there's somebody down in that pit. Hey, come on, we'll help you. Yeah, we'll help you. Pull them out. And then they go intercept the caravan and sell them to the Ishmaelites. Before, and then the brothers are like, what happened? And then let, watch the text and see if it doesn't bear out the, what I'm saying here. So they drew them out and they sold them. And they sold them to the Ishmaelites. The Midianites sold them to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Does that sound familiar? Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Okay, so we got the pieces of silver there. In fact, 600 years before Jesus was sold by Judas for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah, 600 years before, had said that the Messiah would be sold for exactly 30 pieces of silver. Is the Bible true? Does the Bible always 100% come true? Always does. That's not just any old book. It's the Word of God. And so they sold him just like they were sold, sold Jesus. And Reuben returns to the pit after he's done with the barbecue. And he saw, Joseph's not here. He tore his clothes. Wait a minute. If they're the ones that sold him to slavery, why is he surprised by all this? Because that was the plan, but somebody beat him to it. And he returned to his brothers and said, the boy's gone. See, the brothers didn't sell him to slavery. They were going to. It's funny how God thwarted their, oh yeah, you're going to commit this sin? I'm going to make sure you don't make any money off of this. 
Okay? I'm going to let somebody else, some passerby, some Midianites make the money off it. And, and he asked a really interesting question. He said, where shall I go? Like, there's no way I'm going home with this bad news. I do not want to face my father with all this. I, I, I cannot believe we let this happen. So we saw the fatally flawed family. We saw the duo of divisive dreams. We saw that the special son is sent. And then here we saw that the son was sold to slavery, not by his brothers, right? And now finally, the deceived dad is devastated. So then they took Joseph's robe and they slaughtered a goat. Does that sound familiar? You see later, hundreds of years later, Moses went to the law and we have what's called the scapegoat and that the priests lay their hands on the scapegoat. They confess all the sins of the nation and then they drive that scapegoat out into the wilderness to be attacked by bears, lions, and whatever else. And so here, again, an innocent animal is dying to cover up the sins of these brothers. At least that's what they're trying to, but that's the picture that God is trying to paint here. And then they dip the robe in blood. Jesus' robe would be dipped in his own blood later. Then they sent the robe of many colors, what represented authority over them, and they brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Can you please identify? They talked to their dad like they're detectives. Can you please identify whether this is your son's robe or not? Like very cold, calculated, like a private investigator. And he identified it and said, oh, it is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is no doubt, without, without doubt, torn to pieces. He assumes the worst because he's been deceived to, to believe that. And that's, so their plan is working. Then Jacob tore his garments. Okay, that was a a uh, Middle Eastern way of showing grief. And later, Jesus would have his gar- garments torn, but by others, and sackcloth and his loins. And he mourned for his son many days. And that's a throwback to when Rachel died. And it says he mourned how long? It doesn't even say he mourned. And I think the Bible's silence on that says somehow Rachel went from being everything to him to where you stole your dad's gods. You lied to me. You did this, you did that. And then on and on and on. And it's just like when she died, you didn't see anything. His Abraham, his grandfather, mourned for many days about Sarah. Here he's mourning many days for his son. But Rachel evidently had fallen out of favor. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. Hey, dad, it's okay. It's okay. No, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Leave me alone. And he's not being a gracious recipient. <laughs> You know, when people, when all of us are going to have a funeral in our life that we attend, that's going to be someone really close to us. And there's going to be people who come to you to comfort you. And maybe that's the last thing you want at the moment. But be gracious. (laughs) And they may say things that are just stupid. Like, oh, well, they're, you know, uh, uh, up there in heaven bowling and they're happy. They're doing what they want to do or whatever. All kinds of stuff. I've heard that at a funeral. Okay, I did the funeral of a guy who was an avid bowler and they, everybody was talking about how he's bowling in heaven. I'm like, no, he's not. <laughs> okay, anyway, but you just be gracious to people. Just accept it. But here, Jacob, he's not. He's refusing to be comfort. And, and he said, um, no, I'm going to go to hell with them. That's what Sheol means. The grave, Hades, hell. I, I just feel like dying myself. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm mourning so bad that I feel like I'm going to die and just going to join my son in the grave. And thus, that's how his father wept for him. You see the gospel all over this. The father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. Joseph was sent by the son just to see, to make things, sure things were going well with his brothers. His brothers wanted to kill him. They wanted to, to see the worst for him. They rejected his authority. And that's what's going on in our world today. The reason that people hate Jesus is because Jesus didn't come as just a little lamb. He came as king of kings. And the world says, no, you will not rule over us. We will be whatever we want to be. We will identify as whatever we want to identify. We will sleep with whatever we want to sleep with. We will kill each other. We will rape each other. We will murder one another. We will decide who's the winners and losers. You will not rule over us. And just the way the brothers treated Joseph is how the world treats Jesus. But my Bible says that in the end, every knee shall bow. And every means every. Putin will bow. 
Trump will bow. Biden will bow. Rapists, murderers, pedophiles, pornographers, they will all bow their knee before Jesus Christ. You will bow. I will bow. We either can accept the authority of Jesus over our life and say, yes, you will be my king, or you'll be forced to later before you're cast into hell. I don't like preaching on hell. (laughs) But for every one time Jesus talked about heaven, he talked about hell five times. Because he wanted to warn you. And that's what I'm doing here this morning. I'm warning you that you will someday bow before Jesus and accept his authority. The brothers didn't like Joseph's authority. They didn't like his dreams. And people don't like revelation from God in the word that says Jesus is king of kings. But you will make a choice. You can make it now willingly and be saved. Or you can make it later when you're forced to. The Bible says if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And you will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried on the third day. He did what? He rose. When you put your faith and trust in that, not in your good works, not in your baptism, not in your ability to keep the Ten Commandments, because we know that's not working out. When you put your faith in that man on the middle cross and accept his gift of salvation for you, and you say, yes, I will make you Lord. I will bow my knee to you then the Bible says right there in black and white, or red and white in this case, that you will be saved. Have you trusted Christ? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes if you would. If you've never put your faith in Christ, let me tell you that if you think about what he did on the cross, the nails in his hands, the beating he took all over his body, the crown of thorns that went into his scalp, how they plucked the beard from his face, They punched him. They beat him with rods. He did all that for you. He did all that for me. He took what should have been your punishment upon himself. He who knew no sin and never committed any sin, he became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And you could be saved from all that you've done wrong and you could forego that punishment if you'll accept him as your Lord today. Maybe in your heart right now, would you say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe you took my place on the cross and I trust you right now. I'm putting all my faith in what you did and I give my life to you because you gave everything for me. I make you the Lord of my life. Father, thank you for this passage of scripture, how beautiful it is and just how beautiful the life of Joseph is. And Lord, you said that if we're rejected, it's only because they rejected you before us. So Father, help us to handle rejection well because we're different than the world. Not because of our own efforts, but only because of your grace of God. And so we thank you for that. And we just pray Jesus will be glorified in everything. In his name we pray. Amen. If you made a decision for Christ, man, I'd love to hear about. This is my cell phone number. Let me know. Text me or call me. If you have more questions like, yeah, Gary, I just, I'm I'm not ready yet. I I want no more. Let's talk about that. Okay. Ashley, would you like to help me with question and answer session? All right. Where did my glasses go? It's a good thing you're coming up here to read them because I can't, I can't read this at all. It's blocked. There we go. Big step. There you go. All right. So there's the cell phone number you can text. If you're watching from home or online, uh, you can text in your questions. Or if you'd rather just raise your hand, you can do that as well. Okay. So first, what? comment, I guess, is a comment. Genesis 45.4 may be the reason many people get it wrong that Joseph's brothers sold him to, to Egypt. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. Yeah, that's There's that's an excellent point. point, Charity. Good job. So, Good Mr. That's Mr. Charity said that. Mr. Charity? Yeah, Mr. Charity. Okay. <laughs> I'll explain, we'll explain that later. <laughs> so... If you look at it from Joseph's end, he's sold into a pit. He's thrown into a pit. He's drawn out. He's in slavery. He doesn't know where the connection was or wasn't. So that's one way of looking at it. Okay. Or because their intentions were to sell him into slavery. Okay. So one way or another. But technically, and it is a technicality, they didn't actually get the money for it. The Midianites did. But also, neither did the Pharisees. They actually ended up paying the money. Yeah, they paid. And Judas, yeah, so the, the, Judas gave it back, then they bought a field, yeah. 
Because they were too holy to have that money. (laughs) Yeah. Great point. Good job. As God is our father, does this make Jesus our brother? Absolutely. Hebrews says he is our elder brother. And so this is Joseph's elder in the sense that he was put over them. Because the word elder doesn't always mean chronological age. Okay, Like we have elders in our church who are younger than some of you. So elder just means in, in responsibility. Like the Bible says Jesus is the firstborn of creation. Well, he wasn't the firstborn of creation. Adam was, but he's the firstborn in the sense that he has preeminence over it. So he, he has the position of firstborn. Good. In Revelation, it <clears throat> talks about seven lampstands, seven seals, and seven stars. What is the meaning of seven, and does it refer to anything else in the Bible? Sure. You see seven all over the Bible. It's a number of completion or, or perfection, and this is God's wrath being poured out on the earth. So it's God has held back his wrath. Like we see his wrath little bits at a time, but now it's like he's not holding back seven. You're going to get the whole complete wrath. And so that's, um, that's what that's talking about. So you see all throughout the Bible. And the seven seals, so the see, what's being sealed is the title deed of the earth. So you know how you have a title deed to your house, okay? It's filed somewhere, of course, today digitally, or you may have a copy of it. Um, but in those days, you would take it and you would roll it up. You take the parchment, you roll it up, and then you would pour wax on the edge, and you'd seal it once, maybe. And you'd maybe a king or the magistrate of that area would take his insignia on his ring and push it in the wax while it was still soft and warm. And it basically said, nobody can open this except for the person who matches the insignia here. So to perfectly seal the title deed of the earth, it's waxed seven times and imprinted seven times. And so the angels say, who is worthy to open it? And the Lamb of God steps forth and says, I am. And as he pops each wax seal, earthquakes, famine, pestilence, each seal, another measure of God's wrath until God's full wrath is poured out on the earth as he takes back the earth. Because who is the God of this world? Satan is, but it's only temporary. Adam was, God said, hey, Adam, let's be partners here. You help me run the earth. Let's be fruitful and multiply. Let's fill it. Let's make it a great paradise. And Adam said, eh, here you go, Satan. And he gave it over to him. So Satan's like, aha, I got this now. You know, and and Jesus is like, yeah, I'll let you have it for a little while, but I'm going to come back, kick your butt, and take it back. Okay? That's that's what it says in Hebrew, kick your butt. That's that's what it is. That's what it says, Hebrew? In Hebrew, yes. Kick it. Kick it the butt. Uh, um, I actually sent this to you. This is a helpful uh, image to tell the difference between tattling and telling. This helps me a lot at home. Okay, tell us. Okay, so tattling is getting someone in trouble. Telling is keeping someone safe. Tattling is seeking attention or popularity. Telling is seeking safety or justice. Tattling is elevating yourself. Telling is done in humility. Tattling is malicious. Telling is redemptive. Tattling is no one is in danger. It's not urgent, and you can solve it on your own. Telling is someone is in danger. It is urgent, and you need help from an adult in this case. That's good. And then there's some verses here, so... It's right out of Second Opinion, Chapter Four, right there. Proverbs That's good. fourteen twenty five and eighteen seventeen. That's very good. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you sent that to me. If somebody wants that, text me. I'll forward it to you as well. Any other questions, comments? No, no. Anybody else have one? Yeah. All right, cool. Good job. You guys did an excellent job. Let's stand, and we're going to read uh, from Numbers chapter six as a, a blessing over one another. Would you join me on verse twenty four? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. You all are dismissed.